Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Inept General, and welcome to our Total War Warhammer Legendary Lord lore video on Setra the Imperishable. Now, Setra was not always so imperishable, and in fact, he grew up as a prince amongst the royalty of Nekara. His father was the King of Khemri, and he grew up in the fashion to which a prince would be expected to at that time. He was very highly educated, trained from birth to become the successor of his father. As a result, he, from the time he came of age, so probably I'm guessing around maybe 13, 14 or something like that, began to go out and march with the legions of his father's army, fight beside them, speak tactics and strategy with his father and his war councils, and really just be completely involved with the war machinery of Khemri at the time. Now, in the so doing, he began to show massive talent for strategy, for tactical acumen, and he just had this kind of boundless sense of courage, and he was truly a master at martial skill. His blade skills and his skill on a chariot were unmatched among the others of his age, or even much more sort of veteran warriors. He just outshone them completely. Khemri at the time was a busy place for an up-and-coming prince or general even. Wars were abound all over the lands of Nehekara, just kings fighting other kings, they also had sort of intruders from outside of Nekara trying to take advantage of the internal strife, all the individual cities kind of were running as city-states at this juncture, they were just all warring against one another for resources, for territory, and for people. It was just a time of complete strife. Now using this opportunity, the Lizardmen had marched north and began to attack the city of Libaras. And as well as that, huge orc hordes had began to amass and charge south on the lands of Nehekara, as well as the more ambitious northern men that came down, the savages and barbarians that they were, came down to raid, pillage, and gain territory for themselves. As well as this constant need of strife, no kind of infrastructure could be set in place, and the citizenry of the land of Nehekara suffered. There was disease, there was outbreaks of starvation, crops weren't being brought in it was time of sort of very deep climatic difficulty as well their beloved river the river vite had not flooded and thus had not replenished the fields around the river and so crops were failing increasing the amount of starvation going on it was just sheer chaos in a bid to seek some kind of resolution to this the priests of nekara kind of the most learned men of the kingdom put their heads together and like what is going on here why is our land completely fallen apart now being priests they jump to the only logical conclusion that priests could really come up with and that was that the gods were unhappy and so they're like okay we have to appease the gods how should we set about doing this and this began to grow as a theory amongst the priests and eventually made its way to the priests of Khemri. Now Setra was not an unintelligent prince he listened to wise counsel he learned the ways of history he listened to some of the most intelligent advisors he could get his hands on and he began to listen to the priest's ideas about why Nehekara was failing, what was going on, and he took on board some of the, their ideas. Now, at some point when Setra was a fully grown man, his father died, and Setra took over the throne of Khemri, and he immediately began to sort of instill the lessons he'd learned from the priests, and in so doing, his whole first year as king he devoted entirely to reconnecting with the old gods of Nehekara. He salvaged new temples, he built new statues in their honor, he encouraged the populace to pray more than they had been, and after a year, he sort of prostrated himself among one of these altars, prayed to all the old gods and goddesses, and simply asked them to restore Khemri to its former glory. And that night, for the first time in living memory, the banks of their sacred river broke and floods went all over the plains, re-nourishing them and allowing crops to grow once again. Everyone just lost their minds at this. They're like, oh my god, the river's flooding. This is amazing. 
thing? How did he do that? He must be chosen by the gods. And the priests were like, oh, whoa, yeah, this actually worked. We're kind of surprised ourselves. And they recognized Setra as being the champion chosen by the gods of Nehekara. And so he kind of became, got this reputation as being the one king chosen by the gods of old to represent and push forward and show the way forward for Nehekara. And so after this event, kind of half believing his own hype at this stage, Setra masses his armies and he begins his great conquest. The first city on his list is Numas. And then from Numas, he goes to Zandi. And then from Zandi, he starts to spread out all over the lands of Nehekara. And then he pushes north beyond those boundaries, further than the lands or empire of Nehekara had ever stretched before. Any kings that refused to submit, he would simply destroy, and those who did bend the knee would be forced to pay tribute to him and to Kemri going forward. And so that's kind of the way he did things. You either submitted or he killed you. And those were your options when Setra was on his path to conquest. Now during this time, Setra actually begins to sort of build up a reputation. He wins all of these battles battles as his sort of tactical acumen he'd been learning since the time of a child has really hit a peak at this stage. He in fact also starts to sort of train elite troops of men, the most famous of which was something known as the Hawk Legion, which served within his army. Now a number of sort of legions of legend have made it into the Total War Warhammer game, but Setra's was, he had his Hawk Legion, and it was said that many of these legions of legend of old would very much don the outfit of the kind of animal they were named after. For example, there was a very famous crocodile legion uh, that sort of wore crocodile skulls and stuff like that. But the most famous of all the legions of legend were the Hawk Legion of Setra, and they built up a fearsome reputation during this time. Setra, on his path to conquest, charges up north and eventually gets to the mountains and there he fought a savage battle against the bloody fang orc tribe completely annihilating them and then he stood upon the tallest hill in the mountain range this orc tribe lived and looked north and only then did he realize the vastness of the land that lied beyond the black mountains he really hadn't had any idea before and he was overcome with an overwhelming sense of sorrow it had taken him years to conquest up to this point, and he realized, seeing the vastness of the world beyond these mountain range, that he would not live long enough to fulfill his dream of conquering the world. And so he starts to try and think of what he can do about this problem. As a result, he gathers the oldest and wisest priests and scholars from around the lands of Nehekara, and he gets them all together, and he basically says, look guys, I can give you any resource you want, just make me immortal. That is your task, figure out a way to do this. In so doing, he effectively creates what would go on to become known as the Mortuary Cult. Now, during some research, sticking into the realms of medicine and, you know, knowledge and magical potions, they begin to be able to extend Setra's life well beyond that of any living human being. And he lives beyond anything anyone had seen before. But still, age is creeping up on him, still ticking away, he's still getting older. They haven't quite managed manage to solve the problem. And so they start to travel further afield. They travel the world, they learn more potions, they learn incantations, they bring all that knowledge back and concentrate it in the lands of Nehekara, and they begin to sort of exchange knowledge and exchange ideas, and in so doing, they develop this vast lore of um, kind of magics, but not quite. At some point, they do delve into the exploration of magic, but not quite in the early days. It's kind of an advanced medicine, like a magic medicine is what they're picking up and in so doing they kind of develop their own language as well now they have at this stage managed to kind of figure out a way that a body won't deteriorate that's their argument so they can have a body and preserve it forever it won't sort of crumble to dust or become a skeleton they begin to figure this out 
they also start to reach into like the spiritual aspect and they start to make initial contact with what they know as the realm of souls now the realm of souls is what the mortuary cult believe is where all living thing souls go after they die and they're starting to make contact so much to the point that they believe they can pull souls back into the living world from the realm of souls that's their notion that's kind of what they're on the verge of discovering now cetera at this stage in the kind of process had started to become older and they knew they had to begin some sort of solution because cetera very wise great fighter but boy oh boy does cetera have a temper on him if you cross him you're dead if you upset him or disappoint him you're dead probably your family's dead everyone you ever knew is probably dead as well that's just the kind of way that cetera operates just a torrid storm of wrath and fury when Whenever you don't do what he has tasked you with doing and so these guys are always kind of like half hiding what they do know only revealing like bits and pieces enough progress to keep Setra happy but not enough exposing the sort of dead ends they've explored to completely infuriate the man and the mortuary cult kind of just operates on this basis for a little bit amount of time as Setra continues to age now Setra himself has began to consolidate power he's not maybe conquesting as much as he had He's more sort of in the process now of maintaining the borders of the empire he had. And in so doing, he begins to recruit a number of agents to keep really tabs on the other Nehekaran kings. He wants them to sort of be in lockstep with him. No one's plotting, doesn't want any of that kind of silly shenanigans going on. And so around the year 2380, 2370, um, he begins to sort of take notice of a young upcoming officer uh, within his ranks by the name of Nakaf. Now, Nakaf is not of noble birth. In fact, it's even said he's, made, he's not even of Nehekaran birth. He has kind of odd features for Nehekaran, and it's rumored that his ancestry comes from the barbarians north of the Black Mountains in what is to become in the millennia to pass the Empire, but it's nowhere near anything like that yet. It's just kind of the first vestiges of the Empire going around at the time in the form of barbarian tribes. And so he's one of these barbarians however he manages to get himself into Cetra's army and is just immensely skilled at fighting he's hugely strong and his loyalty is unmatched he's just a zealot a zealot believer in the god king Cetra and that's what his idea is of just worshipping him and really just completely devoted to his master and in so doing before he even turns to the age of 18 he already makes it into the tomb guard from the normal warrior ranks the tomb guard being the ultimate elite fighting force although there is a slightly more elite fighting force known as the royal guard within the tomb guard and in less than two years he makes it into that so barely in his 20s already in the most elite fighting force in the land and then within a couple of years of that he proves himself to be the best of the royal guard becoming Cetra's herald now heralds are effectively the champions of a tomb king it's the tomb king's best warrior and sometimes even when tomb kings fight amongst themselves they just say should we just give this to our heralds the heralds fight an individual duel and that's the war decided whatever they were disputing over is settled with that victory so Harold's hugely uh, important position the society at the time and by the time the calf is named as his herald and starts to deal with the problems of just maintaining the empire for Cetra it brings us to about the year negative 2390 now bear in mind Cetra's reign began in the year 2500 so he's been going for a little while at this stage and indeed one of the first notable rebellions he ever had was in the year negative 2383 and that's when King Bagu uh, kind of rose up to fight him and you know what Cetra didn't even bother with that you know who took care of it his right hand guy Nakaf just went in killed the king 
rebellion over and done with. And so even as he's becoming increasingly old and decrepit, he is managing to hold on to the greatness that is his empire through his trusted servant. Now, time continues to roll on, and by the year negative 2350, Cetra, it's kind of on his last legs, really. He's kind of been withering with age, and he has lived an excessively long time. So he gets the mortuary cult together and goes, what have you come up with? You've had all this time. What have you got for me? And so they say, my lord, we've done the research. We are probing into the realm of souls. We are confident that after you die, we can bring your body back. And when we do so, we'd have figured out the immortality problem. So we'll bring you back into your body, which won't have decayed because we figured out this mummification thing. And so you'll be back, fresh body, and then we'll also have immortality ready for you. So it'll be great. You'll lead an empire for a million years. It'll be the most extraordinary thing anyone's ever seen, boss. Honestly, we swear it'll be a golden time. It will be incredible, and in the meantime, we'll look after sort of the kingdoms. We'll make sure everything is ready for your return. We vow it. Just feel free to pass away. Now, Setra kind of half buys this. He's still a bit pissed off about the whole dying thing. So Setra sort of fades away. He dies. He can't stop it. He dies, and when he's dying, he has a sort of curse on his breath. He's like, you're about to fucking breathe, and then dies. So that is the end of the living life of Setra the Imperishable. And he had lived to some, I think, within an estimate, about 165 years old by the time of his demise. Now, once he died, the funeral kicked off. And the funeral was huge. Nakaf, his herald, led the way. And he marched in all the regiments of Setra into his tomb and they were all just buried alive that's what happened such was their devotion to their master all of them buried alive in the tomb along with Nekaf, and there they wait for setra's return now over the millennia that pass until setra comes back a whole bunch of crazy stuff happens the mortuary cult only grows in power and influence they start to sort of spread their wares not only to setra but to all of the tomb kings so they spread out out. They send priests uh, from the mortuary cult to all of the tomb kings, begin to extend their lives, you know, serve them the way they serve Setra, but still holding a little bit of something back. And in so doing, they actually figure out a way to stop their souls leaving their bodies. And so kind of getting one solution to this immortality problem that Setra set them. As such, however, they haven't managed to prevent the decaying process fully. So they may live forever, but their bodies are just kind of rotting husks after a time. Now, this time is an exceedingly long amount of time, but it does happen. Now, the first one of these priests to learn the way of immortality, to stop their soul ever leaving for the soul of realms, was uh, what would eventually become Grand Hierophant Katep. Now, Katep was the first of these, and so after a while, he becomes the oldest living mortuary cult member, and thus becomes their leader, and it really it becomes the most powerful among them. When exactly Hierophant Katep masters this gift and becomes the leader of the mortuary cult, I'm not entirely sure. Because we have another huge character that pops up in the Mortuary Cult that kind of I, takes it over, effectively, and takes over the whole empire. And that is, of course, Nagash, the big bad. Started life much in a similar way to Setra as a Prince of Khemri. But at this stage, the Mortuary Cult is so powerful that all firstborn sons no longer become kings. They all have to be dedicated to the Mortuary Cult. And it's the second sons that become kings. Now, Nagash never really gets over this fact. It pisses him off that he doesn't become king. But he still excels in the Mortuary Cult, learning all their trade secrets. And eventually, some Dark Elves wash up on the shores... Nagash captures them, tortures them, they teach him the way of, I think it's shadow magic, no, it's dark magic, and he's like, oh, this is useful, I can incorporate this into mortuary cult teachings, and he begins to develop what would grow into necromancy, and he's the first one to ever raise the dead with the use of magic, and, you know, the best there will ever be at it. 
So using this new gift, he gathers some pals to him. Amongst them are Arkham the Black. And he says, right guys, I've got this kind of thing going on. Would you like to help me take over my brother's kingdom at this stage once his father had died? And so they're like, oh yeah, buddy, sure, why not? So they charge off, take over his brother's kingdom, and you know what? People start to get wind of his nasty raising the dead tricks, and not everyone's really on board with this whole situation. So they go up to him, attack, and they're like, no, Nagash, you shall not do this to us. They attack him, drive him out, and Nagash is kind of a bit pissed about this entire thing. So he kind of potters off north for a little bit, and, uh, you know, tries to regather his strength. Now, what Nagash had built while he was king of Kemri, he was, at, he was king for a very, very long time, bear in mind. And so what he'd been at is he'd built a huge, vast black pyramid. And in the black pyramid, he used as a means of channeling the winds of magic to him, making him an even more powerful necromancer. And so it was against his great power and might that the uh, Kemrians came and attacked Nagash. And they started to use some of the mortuary cult who helped them out. The ones who weren't loyal to Nagash helped them out by raising statues, putting souls in statues to help them fight off the hordes of Nagash. And eventually Nagash comes back and he's like, nope, nope, I'm going to do this. Gets beaten again by al Qadizar this time. And al Qadizar, who is sort of a great unifier, uh, manages to chase off Nagash yet again. This time, however, Nagash had tied in vampires as well to be his like top lieutenants in his army. And they were a vast and potent weapon, but just not enough. And so by this stage, it's been almost a thousand years since Nagash sort of was born. And this is how long this conflict with Nagash has been going on. So by about the year negative 1151, Nagash, having been beaten again, decides, screw this, I'm going to destroy the entire world. And so he begins what is known as the Great Ritual within his Great Pyramid. Now at this stage, he'd managed to capture al Qadizar, the king who had beat him and chased off his undead hordes once before, and he's keeping him within the Black Pyramid as well. So al Qadizar's in there, the Gash is in there, the Gash is doing the ritual to kill the world so he can raise them all to be basically his puppets. He's king of the world if this goes off. Now at this point, the Skaven do something admirable, perhaps the only admirable thing Skaven have ever done, and really only out of self-preservation, and that is they freed al Qadizar from his cell, they gave him a warpstone sword, and went, you know buddy, do you mind go kill the Gash for us? That'd be a great treat. And so al Qadizar goes off, the gash is just lost in the middle of the winds of magic during this great ritual. Akazar kind of strolls up, stabs him with this mighty sword, and kind of kills him, banishes him from the living realm, let's say. And so Nagash is defeated, but the ritual kind of has this magical backlash that kills everything within Nehekara, the wider empire of the Tomb Kings. And in so doing, in killing everything, it also raises up every single Tomb King, all their dead ancestors within the lands of Nehekara, and so they all rise up at the same time. Now, the cities over millennia had had multiple kings, each with their own armies in their own pyramids and they all started to war amongst one another now this stage setra does not wake up the wardings on his original pyramid the biggest before the black pyramid was built was so powerful that they did not manage to affect his slumber and what it took was grand here from katep to be like guys there's only one thing we can do here to sort out all of these tomb kings killing each other and that is to get setra up so they go in they awake setra and setra kind of rises up with his entire army intact and marches out to bring order to all of this chaos now timelines get a little bit fudged here depending on what source you're looking at but it says it takes Setra about two years to really get everything under control. And it said within this two years, he hasn't really asked how the hell this happened. But it said that after he brought it under control, he got he got all the Tomb Kings 
to go back to sleep and he would keep watch and he's the king of kings and he also managed to drive out Arkan the Black who was still hanging around despite his master's death but then eventually got chased off. Now if you guys have watched my Kalida video uh, popping up in the top right hand corner now or you'll find a link in the description below you'll know that Arkan kind of ran off to Araby, started a whole series of wars in Araby but also managed to warn off Neferata, the first of the vampires, to run away because the tomb kings had all risen from their graves so that's kind of the time period we're talking about so accordingly as i said Setra hadn't asked what had been going on for two years and then once he'd brought order to the chaos after two years apparently at that stage Setra sits down and is like hey guys wtf is going on how did this happen why am I a decrepit mummy? Why are my soldiers all bloody skeletons? What is going on here? And so Katep has to explain the rise of Nagash, how Nagash essentially fucked over the entire empire. Excuse my language, but it's a very strong thing he did, killing every living thing within its borders. And so, understandably, Setra is pissed. Setra's like, how did you let this guy take over the whole mortuary cult, get this kind of power? You're meant to look after my lad, not completely balls it up. And as such, he says to Katep, get the hell out of here. I never want to see you again unless you bring me a solution to bring the lands of the dead back to the lands of the living where we can grow crops and like have flesh and like not be dead you go figure that out you ever get come up with an answer then you can come back to me until then never be seen by me again so he leaves Kemri, uh the grand hierophant and he wanders the lands uh that's kind of a separate story but it's said he becomes this kind of wandering exiled hero who sometimes turns up uh, to help people out uh, in times of need, or to help the Tomb Kings out, not just people in general. But Katap out the picture for now. And so Setra sets up this rule whereby he'll wake you up if he needs you, otherwise Tomb King sleep, we're gonna try and find a solution, I'm workshopping a solution to this whole we're all dead problem, we'll come up with something, don't worry, I've got, I've got people on it, but until that time, I'll guard the borders, you guys all sleep, we'll get this problem sorted out. And so that's kind of the situation most of the time in Nehekara. That's kind of ongoing for a thousand odd years, or maybe sort of 500 odd years, that Setra is sitting there and he's just watching out over the lands. Most of the other Tomb Kings are asleep most of the rest of the time, but if he needs them, he's like, guys, we've got something to do, let's go. Now, the next kind of big thing that happens for Setra is around the year negative 455. So again, this is still about 3,000 years before the start of the Total War Warhammer timeline. And that's when King Kwa and uh, King Arapesh of Numas try to overthrow Setra. They're like, we don't like sleeping all the time. We're going to try and like take over. And they send an assassin with a magical blade to kill him. But Setra has his right-hand man who rose from the dead along with him, Nekaf. And Nekaf manages to fight off this assassin, slaughtering him. And that's when Setra's like, try to kill me, will you? And he summons his army and they march on these two rebellious kings. Now his wrath and fury were terrible in life and they were even worse in death for Setra. And so what he did is eventually he fought the armies of these two kings, shattered their ranks, and then charged on to their tombs where they kind of tried to run away. They were just like, oh no, Setra, we're sorry, we'll go back in our tombs, all bad. Setra's like, no, no, no. Drag them out. And in their sarcophagus, they were dragged out of their pyramids. He had them sort of shattered and broken and placed on the ground where it said that he rode his chariot of the gods over their bodies over and over again until their bones were crumbled to dust. So there was no chance of their return from the realm of souls. They had nothing to come back into. They were done and so that's the vengeance he takes now swift and as furious as it was in life now the kind of idea of this abandoned nehekara with all these riches kind of started to present an opportunity for rich pickings for those brave enough to venture down into the lands because as far as everyone else is mainly concerned they're all dead 
Like, there are some weird stories about skeletons pottering about, but you know what? It seems like everything there is dead. It took a while for people to get used to the idea that this empire disappeared overnight. So, you know, people start to get bolshy about it. And some of the northerners, these northern tribesmen, uh, came down, and they were from the great wastes of the north, even further north than most of the barbarians that the Nehekarans had come to know. And so they come down and start to pillage and ransack tombs, and Setra wakes up some of his vassal kings and like, guys, we've got a problem to deal with. There's kind of this big horde of marauders just pillaging and robbing us, so let's go deal with it. Now this is around the year ne negative 151. Now the marauders are plundering the tombs, and they're being led by a guy known as Valgar the Butcher. And Valgar the Butcher is just having a whale of a time amassing huge amounts of gold and riches, more than the tribesmen had ever seen. They're like, oh my god, this is amazing, until suddenly one day when they're out pillaging, the sky seems to darken, and they all look up, and bloody hell, it's just a sky filled with arrows, and then emerging from the sand around them, from over the dunes, there's this huge army of walking skeletons, and you know, the Northmen aren't afraid of a fight, and so they launch launch into this furious battle. The first wave to fall upon the Northmen after the bombardment of arrows are huge vulture-like birds just ripping at their stomachs and throats and just causing massive amounts of damage. As a kind of retaliatory course, Valgar orders the warhounds unleashed and they start to sort of devour any of the birds on the land and chase them back off into the skies. At this point, spear and axe are just clash in the middle of the deserts of Nehekara and a huge fight begins to erupt between these northern tribesmen and these risen horde of skeletons. Now the northern tribesmen are fierce fighters but they are just severely outnumbered as well as being alive which in this case of a war of attrition is a fatal flaw. They were getting tired also they weren't used to this bloody heat fighting in the scorching hot midday sun of the Nehekaran desert was just absolutely draining them and they began to waver a little bit. Valgar, sensing this, begins to look for something that will lift their spirits, and he, on his majestic demon steed and his magical axe, start to look for something that will lift his soldier's spirits. And across the battlefield, he sees this kind of shadowy outline of a figure on this massive chariot, causing huge amounts of damage to his lads. He goes, right, I'll have him, and my boys will get riled up, and we'll get out of this yet. So he charges across the battlefield on his demonic steed and just screams out a challenge at this chariot fighter. And lo and behold, this shadowy figure was none other than Setra himself on his chariot of the gods. And Setra, seeing this challenge cried out across the battlefield, gladly accepts it. He whips his skeletal steeds and they go charging, carving a bloody swathe of destruction straight through through hundreds and hundreds of Northmen on his way to meet the challenge of Valgar. As he approaches Valgar with one single swipe of his massive heated blade, he immediately decapitates the demonic steed that Valgar was riding upon, assuming the Northmen would go crashing to the ground underneath the wheels of his chariot. But in a great feat of agility, the Northmen, seeing his steed decapitated, managed to use the crumbling steed to vault himself off, straight into the line of Setra, his axe raised above his head, suddenly engulfs itself in flame midair, and he plunges the axe straight into Setra's chest. At this point, Setra starts to feel a burning, not only on the surface of his skin, but deep within himself as well, and his body just collapses into a mound of flesh-eating beetles, who immediately lurch to Valgar and devour him alive, leaving only the bones behind. 
Now, Setra's body needs to recover at this stage from the burning damage that sustained it, and so the beetles, being Setra's essence effectively, fly off back to Kemri. Now, that's not the end of the battle. The Norsemen are kind of taken aback by the loss of their leader, but they have no choice at this point. They are just completely surrounded. It's either fight or die. There's nothing else for them to do. And so they decide, and they kind of get their bearings a little bit and say, guys, we have one chance here and one chance alone we have to fight our way back to the coast back to our boats and just leave get out of here as they the prayer this kind of fighting retreat the guy who kind of assumes command is a chap known as Kaggle Blugfist and he kind of amongst the ruins they, you know, they're kind of, kind of picking up treasures and stuff as they go spots Setra's crown and kind of just pinches it keeps it for himself as they begin to fight their way to the coast now it takes them hours if not days to get to the coast and by the time they get there on one ship only about a dozen of them survived. Of the hundreds and hundreds that had set out, a dozen of them made it back, and they managed to escape. Now, they did manage to escape with a huge amount of treasure as well, making them really kind of the richest guys in the northern wastes. And so they kind of go away, including with the treasure of Setra's crown. Now, it's believed it takes Setra about a decade to recover from the wounds that this magical axe had done to him, but recover he did, and he was just full of wrath and vengeance. Setra, missing his crown with his rejuvenated body, decides, right, I am going to get that back, and he vowed to himself and all of those who bear witness that he was not going to return to Kemri unless he did so by killing every single one of the surviving marauders and reclaiming every last piece of gold they had taken from the lands of Nehekara. And so, with a vast army at his back, he set sail for the northern wastes. By this point, across the ocean in Norska, each of the survivors of the massacre in the sands had become a chief in their own right, and some of them had even gone on to become champions of chaos, gaining the blessings of the chaos gods. So once Setra arrived upon the shores of Norska, he wasn't really chasing down 12 guys, he effectively had to defeat 12 armies. Now, these weren't the armies of sort of barbarian Norsemen, they'd fought before, but many of these armies, now being elevated by the Lords of Chaos, had become a sort of ironclad warriors of Chaos in their own right, and that is what Setra was left to face. And battle after battle, he fought across the frozen wasteland, the giant constructs churning up huge paths through the snow where chariots and skeletal horsemen followed, just carving their way through the entirety of Norska. Throughout these battles, you saw dragon ogres being cut down by Ushapti, trolls turned into pillars of sand. Each battle would have been horrifying for any mortal man to witness and this went on for five years fighting incessantly throughout the northern wastes and it wasn't until five years later that Setra only had one of his enemies left and that was Kaggle Bloodfist, the one who'd stolen his crown from the ground upon which he'd been struck down all those years previous. By this point, Kaggle had become a mighty champion of chaos and had gathered a huge horde to himself. Now, upon this journey, Setra had brought a couple of his agents and his pals, kind of. So he'd brought along Nekaf, one has to presume, his herald, and he'd also brought along a character by the name of Prince Apophis. Now, I'm going to get into this prince a little more in my Missing Tomb King Legendary Lords video, which I'll make a little bit further down the line. But he is essentially a prince who is cursed to search the world uh, to find a soul equal to his own that he can trade places with. Now, the uh, problem with this plan is no two souls are really alike, so he's really been led astray for this curse he's on, but we're not going to get too into it. And so the battle, the final confrontation between these two mighty armies had begun, the Northerners realizing they had to band together under the banner of Bloodfist to fight off this army of skeletons and statues had assembled a mighty host to meet the threat head 
head on. Now, during this battle, Prince Apophis was sort of, uh, you know, he was trying to hunt down this soul. So he kind of tracks down, and being a swarm of insects, basically, a living swarm of insects, he found his way to Bloodfist and was like, hey, buddy, I think your soul can take on this curse rather than mine. Let's do this thing. And, you know, Bloodfist was just like, oh, you give it a go. Swung at him. It's kind of sliced into the insects, didn't do much, but Prophet kind of light quickeningly with his two daggers slid open the champion's throat and killed him before the main battle had started. Now, this caused a huge upset among particularly the marauders of this northern army, and they're like, well, our tribe boss is dead, let's bugger off. However, you know who didn't give up? The Chaos Warriors. They were ready for a fight, and they were not going to go anywhere. At this point, they were vastly outnumbered, but they fought back to back, brother to brother, I guess, as far as Chaos Brotherhood goes, and they just continued the fight incessantly, cutting down huge swathes of the Tomb King army. And the warriors kept on fighting, along with many of their monstrous companions. Indeed, in this battle, Cetra is said to have charged through a hailstorm and a lightning storm, just to be able to cut down a dragon ogre Shagoth with a single swipe of his mighty blade and this battle raged for two days constantly constant battle just an absolute massacre the chaos warriors more than holding their own for an extended period of time but just due to the sheer numbers they had to eventually give out finally once all his enemies were dead at his feet Cetra put on his crown which he'd salvaged from blood fist and it became very clear the fate of all those who opposed Cetra the Imperishable. After this conflict, which the campaign would become known as the Campaign of Sand and Snow, uh, it kind of just like went on as usual. Cetra returned to Kemri. Life continued on. Around the year negative 40 to around negative 15, Nagash returned, exactly 1,111 years after he'd been banished from the living realm. And he was back and he was like, Tomb Kings, I'm going to subjugate you. I'm going to use my magic. But Cetra just said, nope, that's not going to happen fought him back, and Nagash had to retreat. Now, this is the point at which Nagash retreats to the lands that would become the Empire and ends up facing down against Sigmar, who's born around this point and becomes the man of legend, becomes the Emperor around this time as well. So, Sigmar's in the picture now, founding the Empire to the north of Nehekara. So, ongoing, despite the fact that Setra had managed to make his way up to the northern wastes, his full naval fleet hadn't yet been prepared, and it wasn't really ready until the year 101 of the Imperial Calendar, at which point the fleet had regained what it had at its strength, kind of at its peak. So, they were kind of ready to set sail around the world. Now, it's important to remember that Setra isn't just protecting his borders throughout this time. He he is preparing to conquer the world. That's kind of what his planning is all about. Defending his borders for now while they gather their strength, make their plan to take on the world. So the war fleet is obviously a key part of that plan, and he establishes that about 100 years after the return of the Gash. By the year 111, so 10 years after the war fleet is ready, who is to return but Nagash's right-hand guy, Arkan the Black, returns to the lands of Nehekara and sets himself up at the Black Tower of Arkan. Now, there's a kind of uneasy truce but ongoing war, maybe kind of like a North Korea situation here between Arkan and the Kitum Kings. It kind of establishes itself. Itself. They're not in open conflict, but they are hostile to one another, as far as I understand it. Now, there are times I'm sure this erupts into open conflict, but this is the kind of uneasy truce that establishes itself once Arkan kind of carves out a little bit of Nehekara for himself. The next big issuance coming up for Setra was in the year 666. Now, this sounds like a great story, but I was not able to dig anything out on this rather than this very short sentence. If you guys know if there's an actual detailed story of this conflict written down let me know but in the year 666 it's more of a games workshop play on the 666 devil idea um, that the demons emerged in the Hekara started causing huge havoc Setra gathered his hordes but they struggled to fight back the demon horde and lo and behold an army of high elves arrived led by a character known as storm rider who helps them out allegiance himself with the tomb kings and they fight off 
the legions of demons and re-establish order in the Hekara. Now, Storm Rider, as I understand it, is a character who was uh, available for an opening campaign in 8th edition of Warhammer. Um, but at that point, I think he was fighting off the... I think it was the Dark Elves off of an island. The Skaven, actually. The Skaven were threatening to invade Ulfwan. They'd made it to an island off the shore of Ulfwan, and he fought them off. So I'm not sure if it's the same Storm Rider, but it very well may be. Um, I'm just not 100% on this story. Couldn't find enough source material on it, guys, so I apologize for that. But the High Elves and the Tomb Kings teaming up is a cool idea, and I like that they fought off the Hordes of Chaos doing it. And then after that, really, Setra set settles in, continues on preparations, trying to recover from the losses of stuff like the Demon Invasion, the Gash's Return, and by the year 2522, so technically just kind of bringing it up to modern Total War Warhammer timeline. Now, the Warhammer timeline itself is a little bit further ahead than the Total War Warhammer timeline. So Warhammer timeline I take from the coronation of Karl Franz, which is around the year 2500. And this is about 22 years after that. Cetra gathers his troops and marches out ready for the conquest. But I think you can take the beginning of your Total War Warhammer campaign as the Tomb Kings for Cetra ready to conquer the world, marching out on the rest of the lands. Now with an immortal body, it looks a bit more rubbish than maybe being promised, but he is going to conquer the world. So Cetra and his great purge begins. And that really brings Setra's story up to date. So let's take a look at the rules of Setra in the game, in both in tabletop and see how they compare, shall we? So in the game, Setra has the crown of Nehekara. Now what this does is, uh, well what it is firstly, is much like the ancient Egyptian pharaoh's crown when the, I think it was the northern uh, uh, Nile and the southern Nile uh, regions were sort of put into one. You had the two crowns merged into a single crown that the pharaoh would use, and that's kind of the same idea now don't correct me if i'm wrong on that i know i'm probably not right but it was two realms of, of ancient egypt that got together and they put two crowns together and that formed the crown of the pharaohs very much the same with the crown of nehekara but this is sort of several different crowns that have all been combined to form one crown now in the uh, sort of tabletop version of the game what the crown would do would allow any units within six inches of setra to use his weapon skill so it allowed them sort of a better chance to hit and the like so but in the game of course the crown of nehekara is a sort of armor buff it does physical resistance it's a chance of intercepting armies in the underway and the buff itself is constant, and it does more armor-piercing damage, more weapon damage, and more charge bonus. Now, what it also does is affect allies in range, which is kind of a good... It's a kind of a good translation of the rule, I think, as a whole. Just allowing them a better weapon damage, better armor-piercing. Really, to be completely accurate, it would have, I think, given them better melee attack. Um, but, you know what, I think it's a good translation in the game, as opposed to the tabletop version of it. The other item he has that made it into the game is the Chariot of the God, which is a blessed chariot, blessed by all the gods and goddesses of Nehekara, and this gives a, a mystical flame around the wheels. Now, what this would do on the tabletop would add extra impact attacks, it would add a magic attack, and it would give him full armor, so essentially a buff to his armor and a buff to magic attack. It kind of does the same in the game as well, gives you magic and flaming attacks. Um, I'm not sure if it gives you more armor. It may do. I think it does give you more armor. And, um, of course, it's a mount. It's a chariot. gets you to move around faster. And I'm sure it comes with a higher charge bonus as well, being a chariot. So, you know, again, a pretty good translation. Now, stuff that didn't make it into the game was things like the uh, Scarab Brooch of Usirian. Now, Usirian is the Tomb King God of the Underworld, and he would allow a sort of protective energy field around Cetra, giving him a ward save. So that would make him more resistant to magic as well, and ward save would be a save against every kind of attack. So you'd get magic resistance on top of a 50% ward save, which was pretty good as far as items go. And he also had 
the Blade of Petra, which does make it into the game, um, and it's said to be blessed by the Sun God, and it glows white hot. It's just that piercing hot all the time, it's said to contain the equivalent heat of the entire desert of Nehekara. It also causes a blinding effect on its enemies. It just burns that brightly. Now, in the tabletop, that would give him flammable attacks. It would make it so all the damage goes through. You can't make an armor save against the weapon. And it would give a sort of minus one chance for monsters and other characters to be able to hit Cetra. The idea is that they're blinded by this light in their eyes. Now, in the game, they've been pretty accurate to that. They've uh, done it so that you do get the blinding effect, which gives minus 25 melee attack, minus 40% accuracy, minus uh, 25 melee damage. And of course, it also has the public order bonuses, the plus 7 melee attack, and plus 12 weapon strength, as well as enabling uh, magical attack. And that's about it, really, for uh, Cetra's items on the tabletop and in the game. I'm not sure why they decided not to give him the brooch. Uh, maybe they thought they, it made him a little bit OP. Uh, but there we go. That is uh, Cetra the Imperishable for you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Really not a character to be messed with. Short-tempered, horrendously violent, and extremely powerful. He also, of course, has access to the lore of Nehekara, and it's said that when he was kind of learning from these priests and dealing with the foundation of the Mortuary Cult, he actually was there for the founding of the language, and so he is, I believe, the only Tomb King who can actually understand the language of the mortuary priest um, to kind of better get uh, a knowledge of the stuff they teach so you know a bright a hugely intelligent guy fiercely ferocious and definitely with some anger issues but you know what what good general in the warhammer world doesn't so that about sums it up for Setra, guys as always a huge thank you to you all for watching and i hope to catch you all on the next one bye guys